Hi, everybody. I'm here. I'm finally in the group. I'm in the right place, I think. Um, I hope to see you starting to make comments and tell me that you're here. Um, last week, I accidentally <laughs> posted this on my own timeline, but this should be in the group now. Uh, it'd be great if some of you are there, if you can tell me that you can hear me okay, because that's always of concern. Hi, Wendy, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Please let me know that you can hear me and then I'll be okay. Hi, Susan. Hi, Joan. Hi, Danny. Oh, gosh, lots of you. Hello, hello. Hello, Louise. Hello, Jennifer. Please tell me if you can hear me. Hi, Ivo. Hello. <laughs> okay. So, do you know what? Just tell me whether or not you can hear me okay. Hi, 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 everybody. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Su thank you, John. Great. Now, thanks, Wendy. I'm so glad you can all hear me. So um, today is Philo Friday, as uh, Philo Friday, as uh, as you know. Um, I'm gonna just refresh. Hi, Louise from Santa Fe. I'm gonna refresh uh, to some people because some people asked me, can you please tell us again what Philo is? Um, somebody actually wrote me uh, about this. Um, Philo is a traditional form of, well, it's not a form, but it's a practice of storytelling after dinner, which for me is just about right right now because I just had dinner. It's, so it's between dinner time and bedtime where the whole family gathers together and uh, it, and somebody, usually the head of the family, but I think other people would take turns, would tell stories. They could be legends. They could be stories about the family. They could be just things they've made up. Um, and you know, kind of oral history, part of the oral history tradition. The purpose of it was there were many layers to it. It was to stay warm because they were all cuddled together in the usually in the very often in the barns where the uh, where the animals were kept, so it kept them very warm in the winter times. It was also to pass pass on the family history, which is all what we're about. Um, it was also entertainment because there was no such thing as radio or TV back then. And uh, yeah, uh, and I think it really had a very important part of the culture uh, in, in Trentino. Um, Dan Franceschi asked me, does it have something to do with the word for to spin? And actually, yes, it does. It was traditionally the time where women would do their spinning of the various yarns. But I think it also had a double meaning, meaning um, kind of spinning a tail. But that's kind of my take on it. Anyway, now that I've said that, and now that so many of you are here, Today, I had a question. I think actually Louise had asked this question, but lots of other people have asked this question. Why did, what made our ancestors emigrate? That's a huge question. And I can't possibly um, answer all of that today, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to put it in a form of a story. So what I'm gonna try to do first, back some years ago when I was taking a, a class on uh, writing your family history, I wrote a short story about what, and I mean short, short, like two pages, so it's not a long story, um, about what it felt like the first time I went to Trentino. And I'll, I know a lot of you have been there, and I'm sure that you will relate to this. And I know a lot of the others of you have not yet gone there, and you, this may trigger something that uh, you, know, you wanna feel and you wanna answer. So, what this story is, is actually, I'm going to change my glasses because those are like magnifying glasses and they're for my screen. So this is actually for reading. Um, this is a story, well, those are kind of reflective, aren't they? You know what, I'm going to put these on anyway. I don't care if they're magnifying glasses. There, hello. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. And the name of it is um, Squalid Misery. Okay, so this is something I wrote five, six years ago reflecting on the first time I went to Trentino. Miseria, squalida miseria. Anna Maria Ducchi, a robust resident of this tiny rural frazione of Bono in the western part of Trentino, speaks with me as we stand in the courtyard that lay between the ancient homes of our respective ancestors. Kissed by the warm July sun, and surrounded by the breathtakingly beautiful panorama of the Giudicari Valley in the Italian Alps, I feel a chill run up my spine as Anna Maria tells me stories about our ancestors and about my present day Serafini cousins who live in nearby villages of Dubredo and Fiave, because I haven't met them yet. As neither of us could speak each other's language at the time, 
and we can only understand bits and pieces of what the other is saying, I depend upon my friend and traveling companion, Vanessa, who painstakingly translates for me throughout this 10-day ancestral journey. Even when the six people are talking all at once in a mishmash of Italian and English and local dialect, which is, frankly, most of the time. I had just met Anna Maria a few minutes ago. She must be similar to me in age, and our grandparents were born around the same time in the same parish in the 19th century. Her family lived in the house next door to the Honoratis, my grandmother's family, for longer than anyone can remember. But unlike my present-day Honorati cousins, who were not raised in Bono, but not even in Trentino at all, Anna Maria has never lived anywhere else. The simple fact, this simple fact gave her one valuable asset that none of us standing there had. Continuity. I cannot help but feel the contrast between our lives. Over the course of my life on this planet, I've lived in 10 different cities and towns, on five different United States, in three different countries. And when I moved around so much, whether I moved around so much because I never felt rooted anywhere, or whether I felt unrooted because I moved around so much, I don't know. But for Anna Maria, continuity is the fiber of her very being. Every story, every person, every experience she had ever known has been in this place. And what I'm learning as I speak to her is that even in a village as minute as Bono, which has been on the map for at least 800 years and probably a lot more, but has a current population of fewer than 100 people, has a myriad of stories to tell us about its land and its people. And the way it tells its story is through people like Anna Maria. Anna Maria's is not an unusual case until this mass immigration started at the end of the 19th century, which we're going to talk about. The contadini, peasants or the farmers, depending who's translating, uh, they rarely would move from place to place, like so many of us do today. Their lives were inextricably linked to the land. Their very survival depended upon the earth of these alpine hills, the fresh water that sprang from the mountain Sorgente, and the sky that was so close to the earth that the clouds themselves would waft mistily across the farmlands of apples, grapes, and corn. But their survival also depended upon their own man-made creations. In Bleggio, the parish where Bono is located, the unique four-story houses of the Contadini were built not just to be cozy places for their eating and sleeping, but hardy functional structures that were integral to their way of life. The lower level, which we're sitting in now, try to imagine we're sitting in it now, the lower level built below ground and accessed via a ramp housed cows and other livestock, especially during the long snowy winter months. The top floor was a massive pantry for grains and other foodstuffs, and the floor below that was reserved for firewood, hay, and other practical everyday items. Only the ground level was reserved for human habitation. Every house, every house had one specific room reserved for filo, a Trentino tradition in which the whole family would gather around the fire and share stories, often told in verse. Uh, in dialect, Filo means to weave. The explanation for why it's used to describe story storytelling is that the women would usually use the time to weave while listening to the stories. Now, I cannot help but think it might also symbolically refer to how the storytellers would weave their tales as they went along. I just said this, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was in the story here. Filo provided a way for families to come together, perform their household chores, have fun, express the creativity, and preserve oral history gathering together in a single room, sometimes along with the cows and the other animals, also help them stay warm during the cold winter nights. Truly, the very design 
of the family home was a container for everything that defined their lives. But in addition to the land, the water, the sky, and the family home, there was one more ingredient that ensured the family's survival, and that was the family unit itself. While we in our 21st century consumer thinking believe we can own homes and property, I think the Trentini, our Trentino ancestors, in a way felt that the family belonged to the land and the house, not the other way around. The purpose of the family unit was to ensure that all things functioned properly. And for that reason, families traditionally stayed put in one village or even one house for centuries and centuries. If it could be said that a family belonged to the house and the land, it is equally true that the individual belonged to the family. Women would move home to their husband's family, passing down the family home from one generation to the next. And notably, other surnames, once surnames came around, uh, used in the 16th century, while the children would take on their father's surname at birth, the wives would keep their maiden name throughout their lives. Your surname at birth was your surname for life. Identifying one's family of origin was seen as part of the natural order of living. And before I arrived at Bono that morning, I knew almost none of this. But now, after a lifetime of dreaming, of coming to this land in which my father had been born and all of his ancestors, as far as anyone could remember, I had much to think about. My senses cannot simply absorb enough of this indescribably captivating, beautiful land, the pristine freshness of the air and the majesty of the rolling green mountains that hold this valley within its embrace. I look at these wonderfully quirky houses which have inhabited these same families for hundreds of years, and I ask myself, what could possibly make anyone leave this beautiful place forever? And even more specifically, what could possibly make so many Trentini leave behind this land, this air, these crystalline mountain waterfalls, their history, their culture, and the support of their family to go work in the pits of the dark, damp, dangerous coal mines of the United States? Miseria, says Anna Maria. Misery. No. Nope. Not just misery, she clarifies, squalida miseria, squalid misery, povera povera, she says. They were poor beyond poor. They lived in abject poverty and wretchedness. We cannot possibly imagine what our great grandparents and grandparents had to endure, she says. We have absolutely no conception of how destitute and desperate they truly were. Well, she's right, I have no conception. And looking around this idyllic paradise, I cannot imagine how I could ever have, how it could ever have been such a place of suffering that my grandparents and dozens of their brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, and cousins would uproot their families, abandon everything else they ever knew, and voluntarily choose the bleak and treacherous life of the immigrant coal miner, often never to see the light of day in the winter months, and in a land that they could not speak the local language, leaving themselves vulnerable to years of bigotry and economic hardship. And I, all I can think of is, what happened here? So that's that story. It was intended to be the first chapter of a book, which I never finished, or actually didn't quite start. But that's the question. What happened here? Um, I think it sets the scene for what a dramatic shift that is. Um, would love to know your feedback on whether you thought that was uh, set the point. But looking at the riddles, it, the question, the first one is why 
Why did they leave? What made people leave? And I've done some uh, research on this, so I just wanted to look some things up. And I have a couple of books that I looked at this week. One is, um, I can't see myself anymore because I have my screen, my notes up. Hold on a second. Let me just move this so that I'm looking at you and my notes at the same time. There we go. This one is very interesting. Uh, it's uh, Delle Condizioni Economiche del Trentino, which means uh, the conditions, the economic conditions of Trentino. Um, and the date is 1880. Now, what's interesting about that is it's, this was written in 1880 at the very beginning of the whole wave, the first wave of um, immigration. And so it's written in the perspective of somebody who had, who was living then at that time and was analyzing the situation at that time. Now, what's interesting is I compared it to this book, which I showed you last week, Le Stagioni della Solidarietà, <laughs> Solidarietà, which means the seasons of solidarity. This one was written a hundred years after that book. That one was written in 1880. This is written in 1980. So they're actually talking about the same period of time. Uh, although this one obviously goes further, it goes past, um, talks about World War One era, and yeah, I think it even touches on World War Two. But I'm mainly looking at up to the era of, say, World War One or right past World War One, because most of our ancestors came before then. So some of you have ancestors who came in the early wave, and some came in the later waves. So let me just give you some ideas. Um, what's really interesting is this book. He talks about, well, actually, they both do. So I kind of combined the, the different things from both of the books, but the, the yellow one here, the one from 1880, he talks a lot about kind of like what was the idyllic life before all of the migration, immigration happened. And something that I, I, I'm not going to have enough time to go into everything I want to tonight. So what I might actually want to do is compress this a little bit, but um, because that story took a little longer. But just let me try to summarize what it was. First thing he's talking, or they're both talking about, is that you have to understand our ancestors lived um, really a very feudal way of life, even into the era when the rest of the world was becoming industrialized. Uh, Trentino was a very late adopter of industrialization and, um, and, and uh, con consumerism. There was, even though people, um, still needed some extra incomes. They basically lived, most of them had some level of subsistence farming. Uh, people were used to creating local pacts of, uh, called Carte de Regola, which were um, charters of rules for the local communities of how to share the land, how to share the land, how to share the water, how to share the mountains, the pastures, the forests, everything. And what that did was it made, developed a, a, a community feeling amongst them, but it also ensured that nobody was ever left out. That if anybody was in need, as long as everybody contributed to the community, which they did as a rule, uh, if anybody was ever in need, the rest of the community stepped forward. Now, I think a lot of us are starting to see that even in our current situation in the world, that local communities we realize as people, as human beings, this is actually the natural order of things. We need our communities to help us. And the Trentini were like this. They, they have centuries and centuries and centuries of records. And on some other time, I'll show you some of those um, called the, the Charters of Rules, the Carte de Regula, which are, um, again, the agreements of how are we going to use all the wonderful resources we have so that everything is fair to everybody. And so that's how they lived. Now, as the world changed, they had to get some other sources of income. So they used to do, and that's, I think, what this kind of, the title here is about seasons of solidarity. Um, a lot of the men would, in the winter, do seasonal migrations, meaning that in the winter, they couldn't just sit around twiddling their thumbs and making woodcrafts all the time. So what they would do is they would go to other places to get winter work, like um, cutting down trees, building roads, building bridges, not bridges, but walls, <laughs> maybe bridges, um, and things like that. And uh, chimney sweeps, people like that, they would go around in the winter and doing all those kinds of things. 
So where did they go? Well, they would sometimes go to other parts of the province, but they would also go to adjacent provinces or regions, like, for instance, present day, well, it was still called it then, Lombardia and uh, Veneto, which we see a lot of in the news right now. We're seeing a lot about Lombardia in the news and Lombardia. Lombardia especially, well, both Lombardia and Veneto had very, very close relationship with Trentino in the past. They were all part of the Austrian or the Austro-Hungarian or the Holy Roman Empire um, at some point. Now, what happened was, if you know your history, round about and kind of pay attention to this date ish uh, in the uh, 1859 and then later in uh, 1866, in that period of time where the so-called wars of independence, well, first, um, which one first? Lombardia. First Lombardia became part of Italy. It was no longer part of Austria. And then Veneto. So what that what happened was then, so now you've got this kind of triangle where Trentino is here. And instead of people kind of crossing and trading, um, like for instance, Veneto had a lot of wheat. Trentino didn't have a lot of wheat, but they had things like um, wine, <laughs> grapes, and they also grew um, silkworms, which is something I'll, I'm gonna come back to in a minute. So that those things could cross borders really easily and so gave the Trentini wheat and it gave the people in Veneto wine and silk worms. Um, but once the borders changed, there were customs borders. There wasn't as free uh, traffic that changed life. So that had a big impact uh, on this place that was all kind of very feudal was starting to get taken over by politics and then also by capitalism and industry that was starting to grow. So that's what was going on then. Um, let me come back to this silkworm thing. Maybe some of you don't know, some of you I'm sure do. Trentino had a really strong cottage industry, meaning like an extra thing that people did in their homes of raising silkworms. They would grow mulder mulberry bushes, which silkworms love to eat. That is their food. So they would grow the mulberry bushes and then the silkworms would eat the mulberry bushes and then they would grow their cocoons. And then at that time they would ship off the cocoons to the um, silk manufacturers who would then turn that into silk. I won't go into the process for it, it's kind of grisly. I don't think I ever wanna wear silk again, but nevertheless, um, that's what they did. They would raise them to that stage, but something happened. And that was a really important cottage industry for many farmers, even my um, cousin Aldo, who's 99 now is he? Um, he remembers our his grandparents having silk um, silkworms, raising silkworms when he was a little boy, because he came to America in the 20s. So he was a little older. He's a little came a little after my dad did. My dad came a little younger. So he's my dad's first cousin. Anyway, so he remembers them growing silkworms. Well, what happened in the around at the same time that all this politics was going on, there was a blight that affected all the mulberry uh, bushes, uh, mulberry plants or bushes, I guess they're bushes, shrubs. And um, it essentially, it was, a, I think it was some kind of fungus. I, I, don't, I don't know all the technical terms and I don't know much about these kinds of things, but it was a parasite or a fungus or something that killed, killed off the plants. So no plants, no, um, no silkworms. And I think there was also some other kind of parasite that actually killed off the silkworms themselves. So essentially this industry that had been there for a really long time and supporting them was, uh, was gone. So between the lack of free trade and then the silkworms, that was something uh, that started things kind of going uh, downhill. Now, after that, there were uh, there was also a blight that affected the grapes. So there goes some of the wine industry. There was hoof and mouth disease amongst the, the cattle, the, the cows and other, uh, other uh, animals. Uh, I know there was a cholera epidemic. I think that may have been a little earlier, but still uh, that was going on. There, was, there were other blights that affected potatoes and fruit, a lot of different kind of blights that came in. Now I'm gonna switch streams and go to riddle two. What does America have to do with this? Well, I'm gonna to touch one thing. I'll come back to it in a middle, minute. It's kind of a trick question. I probably shouldn't have worded it the way. It's not that it caused immigration, but how did, some th how did contact with America contribute? Well, some of it was that certain plants were coming in from America, and I'm gonna mention one in a minute. <laughs> certain plants were coming in from America and hence also 
parasites and diseases of those plants coming in, which affected crops as well. So it's not that America that they're to blame for, it's just that by dint of bringing in things from the outside, uh, they're always gonna have an impact. So that, that affected things as well. But the one thing that did affect uh, Trentino, which um, I know a lot of you are familiar with, was the fact that we, our culture, we eat a lot of polenta. Now polenta, corn or maize was not, it's not indigenous to, to Europe, it's, it comes from the Americas. It was brought over a long time ago. It's been in Europe for a long, long time, 500 years or something. It's, it's been over in Europe for a long time. However, with one difference, the um, Central Americans who eat a lot of corn knew, and I don't know if they knew it just because they liked it this way or if they knew that it was important to digestion or health or whatever, they have the practice of cutting the corn with lime. That is integral, and I'll come back to that in a second. In Trentino, they don't like the taste of it, or they never did. Maybe, maybe now things have changed, but they never liked the taste of it. They liked it the way it was. So they would make polenta with just the corn and uh, not the same way that say the Mexicans or Central Americans did. So that's fine. However, when you start getting crops that fail, uh, or animals that are dying and your food supply becomes limited and you have then limited trade with other areas, well, now you get a population very similar to the way the Irish were with potatoes, which also came from North America, but um, you now you get a population that is too dependent on corn, which is cheaper to produce, too dependent upon it for survival. Now, what that causes is a disease called pellagra which I have a book on it, it's an amazing book. It is in English. It's called A Plague of Corn. Pellagra is a really horrible disease that, um, uh, it, it's a niacin deficiency. It's a vitamin B6, I think it is, uh, deficiency. It can be fixed so easily with nutrition, but it can kill and it's a really horrible disease to, to die from. So there were a lot of people in Trentino who were suffering from that not because they loved polenta too much, but because they were too poor and the economic situation was too horrible to really eat anything else. So it was either eat it or starve. Uh, so, and some people didn't get sick from it, but a lot of people did. Now, if they had known at the time, which it was studied much, much, much later, that the reason why Mexicans didn't get it, for instance, was that they cut the corn with lime, which in some way kept the niacin from getting leached out of their bodies. So I know that's a lot very scientific, but I, I find it very interesting. But essentially the reason why to me it's so poignant is that really they were dying from poverty. They were dying from poverty. So then to put the icing on the cake, you've got um, in the 1880s, which is when really most of the immigration happened after the 1880s, there were two huge floods, especially in 1882, that inundated the whole area. It caused um, tremendous loss of crops, tremendous, um, uh, landslides and houses being knocked down. I mean, we've seen those pictures from, say, DeMauro from um, uh, 2018. Well, this was much worse. This was this was this was heavy, and it uh, it just flooded the whole area. And so, people, what was left, you know, after all the other stuff that was going on, it um, it really hit them hard. So this is why Anna Maria is saying squalid de miseria, squalid misery, abject misery. It was thing after thing after thing after thing. It was the politics, it was the, the being left behind economically in a world that was getting increasingly industrialized. It was the the blights, the failure, the the, the all of it, all of it, all of the things I just said. Um, now coming to that second riddle, uh, anybody want to take a guess, apart from the thing I just said about corn and whatever, the, the about the the connection with America. Anybody want to take a guess in the room? Now this is my conjecture. This is not anything I got from these books. This is simply my conjecture. Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody still there? Hello? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, here's my guess. If you look at these dates, this so we're looking mainly at the 1860s. Um, if you think about the United States, for instance, those of you who live in the United States know very well that you've learned in school that early 1860s was the American Civil War. 
Oh, thank you. Hello. Now I'll see. I'm seeing people now. I didn't see all those comments. Hold on. Great grandfather entrepreneur. Da -da -da. I'll have to read them in a minute. You sure you ever figured out medical? No, that's something. Not going there right now. Uh, jobs, mining, need for labor. Okay, Laura. I think uh, yes, they went over from mining, but uh, and but the Laura, you have hit it on the head from my perspective. The United States was changing. So I, in my experience, in my study, people don't leave unless it's they're being uh, pushed and also pulled. So they're being pushed out of their own country through need. But where do they go? They go to the place where there's a pull. Now, the United States at this particular point in time, the, the Civil War happened. What was going on in the United States? Well, first of all, you get the abolition of slavery, good thing. Um, but what happened also as a result is that all of the economy in the United States was shifting northward to industrialization. So instead of now the South being the, uh, the, the major economy with the farmlands, it was the North. And so the North was developing quickly. They needed cheap labor fast. So Laura, Laura, you said need for labor. Yes, it isn't just that they that the Trentini were looking for jobs. Yes, but the Americans were looking for cheap labor. Now, the first things they did was, I believe, the first ones they got with the Irish because the Irish were coming after the potato famine of the 1840s and they put them on the railways. Um, after that, they hired the Chinese. And I can't remember, I don't really know why, why the Chinese were kind of being attracted there. But then they went after the peninsula of Italy. It didn't matter whether it was Austria or Italy, it just that whole area. And so, and they, why did they want them in the mines? Well, you know, I, I have no idea. Perhaps it's because our Trentini ancestors knew a lot about mountains and uh, tunnels. They were really good at building those things. And they knew that they weren't going to be afraid of going down into these dark places and digging a lot of holes and um, and dealing with all of that. So they were, it was cheap labor. They went after them, they drew them in. So people as a rule, so the question is what happened here? Why, why did my ancestors leave? Um, or our, when you're asking yourself, what when we ask, why did our ancestors leave? Well, there's a push due to hardship, but there's always a pull. There's, a, there's an emptiness somewhere else where some other country is, or some other place is saying, we need you. And this is what I observe all the time in any kind of disaster that's happened, any kind of migration that's happened in history. Uh, I, I see this all the time. And also the social classes will shift around, but any kind of migration, you're always gonna see those two things, all right? I wanna leave you with one last thing that I think um, is really a brilliant quote. And it's from a book called The Immigrant Migration, which I bought back, I don't even remember, some years ago. But I always read it to any classes I give on uh, Italian immigration. Maybe if you've heard this before, it's such a brilliant quote. Uh, and it, I, it's, nobody knows who said it, but it was in a book called, um, a, a book called Italian Americans. No, no, I think that was, his, I can't remember. But anyway, the fellow's name is Barry Morena, but I don't know, I have the date of 2003. I may have it mixed up with which, what book I got it out of. But anyway, here's the quote. It goes, I came to America because I heard the streets were paved with gold. When I got there, I found out three things. First, the streets weren't paved with gold. Secondly, they weren't paved at all. And thirdly, I was expected to pave them. So anyway. Um, it's got, I love that quote. So uh, it gives you a little bit of an idea. So in that uh, in that regard, let's have some compassion and love for all of the um, the things our ancestors went through for our sake. Um, it's uh, when we go to Trentino now. It is such a beautiful, breathtaking, spiritual place, and it's really really hard to even imagine that there was so much suffering there at that time. Um, but uh, hopefully this. Uh, Hopefully this chat will have, uh, or this podcast will give you some, some ideas. Uh, 
Right, who came working in the mines. Lots of people went to the mines. I think uh, textile jobs and immigrants in the cities. Yes, that too. Chinese built the railroads. Absolutely, Diane, they did. In fact, they came in after the Irish were deemed to be too, um, I can say this because I'm half Irish. The Irish were deemed to be a little too um, uncontrollable. <laughs> they had their minds of their own, whereas the Chinese were very um, obedient. And so, yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. They did come in. Uh, civil war, yes, Robin, I guess civil war. I believe that is the case. That's me. But that's my observation. I've never read this anywhere else. This is me as an outside observer looking at it all and thinking that that's the way it is. Um, what I would love to know is, first of all, did you enjoy this? And secondly, what other subjects would you like me to approach in, in future um, uh, storytelling periods of time? Uh, anything. I mean, I can't say that I'll know it all, but I can look things up. I can, I can try. I may know some of it, but I, I can look things up. So anyway, guys, thank you very much. My health is better. Thank you. Um, it's not perfect. I'm still a bit sluggish. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for asking everybody. And I'm really glad that you came in. This video will be live if you missed any part of it. I mean, not live, but be you can see it uh, in a few minutes. I'm also going to start to put these on YouTube. Um, but I'm still a bit slow right now. So thank you very, very much. I'll come in and see your comments and try to comment back to you in a few minutes. Take care, everybody. It's uh, 8.30 at night here, so I'm going to, it's Friday night, so heck, I'm, I'm signing off. Take care. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.